series in the book of James. So you can keep your Bibles there at James chapter 4, which we, we read just now. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, that uh, later on. You can also uh, refer to the outline and uh, it will give you some uh, space. You can jot down any notes uh, of things uh, that you've learned or uh, to apply in your life. And you can take that home and reflect on it uh, during the week as, uh, as you read the Bible and pray at home. Well, let's uh, pray that God would open our hearts uh, to his word to receive it. James writes, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Heavenly Father, we pray now that you may grant us soft hearts to receive your implanted word. As your word exposes our sin and the reality of your coming judgment, humble us, Lord, before you. Let us not be proud or arrogant, but humbly dependent on you, the sovereign ruler of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. So the saying goes. Uh, it means uh, that money is essentially the most important thing in life. Money makes things happen. Money solves problems, and so money is what the world chases after. Money is what we often chase after. Money, I take it, is the reason why so many Malaysians flock to Singapore for work. Uh, money is the reason, I take it, why many Malaysians study abroad in Western countries. Migration offers prospects of a better life, greener pastures, better jobs, higher pay security, and the lifestyle that goes with it. Now, perhaps not many of us are planning to migrate this morning. You can let me know later. Uh, but we may still be driven by the same desires, uh, the desires to be rich, the desires to have a nice house, the desires to get a promotion and a better job and earn that little bit more to be a bit more secure, to be a little bit more happy in our lives. And yet, of course, as we pursue money and pursue such comforts, we're often very short-sighted. Uh, our focus on money and lifestyle can often blind us to the effects that the love and pursuit of money can have on us and those around us. Uh, in many Western countries, they are some of the richest countries in the world. But, of course, in those countries, Christianity is in astonishing decline. Uh, as wealth increases, so it seems does atheism and immorality. And you would think that material prosperity would make people more grateful to God, that they would draw near to him in thankfulness for his wonderful provision in their lives. But it seems quite the opposite. Uh, money often takes people away from God. It makes them proud. It makes them self-sufficient. Because if you have everything in this world now, well, why do you need God and why do you need a world to come? It shouldn't surprise us then what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In the same chapter, Jesus taught that us to seek treasures in heaven above, not treasures on earth. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. His point is, what you treasure is what you will serve. And we all have a choice in our life whether we will choose to serve money or whether we will choose to serve God. Will we acknowledge his rule and humble ourselves before him? Or will we, in proud self-sufficiency, go our own way? What we've seen in this uh, letter that James's primary concern is that we have an undivided faith. He wants our lives on the outside to match what is on the inside. He wants us to have a living faith, to be Christians not in word only, but in action. And, and last week we saw the repeated emphasis on humility. Chapter 4 verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Because James knows that in the end, every single one of us must give account to the sovereign God as the judge 
of our lives. And so chapter 4, verse 12, we ended last week with this verse. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. God is the judge, and it is to that coming judgment when Jesus returns that this chapter is all about. He talks about judgment against arrogant bolsters. He talks about judgment against rich oppressors. He talks about judgment against impatient grumblers. He takes, talks about judgment against dishonest oath-making. And it's likely he's lifted all of these various topics from Leviticus chapter 19. You can look at that later. The passage about loving your neighbor because God is holy. All these topics are listed there. So let's start with the first point, James's first warning against arrogant bolsters, arrogant bolsters. James here condemns those who make plans apart from God, those who plan as if they are in charge of their own destiny. Look at verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and make trade and make a profit. Now, of course, we all make plans for the future, don't we? What course we're going to study, what job to take, uh, how to earn and provide for our families, and so on. It's good to make plans. After all, failing to plan is planning to fail. I'm sure you've heard that. But James condemns here the kind of pride that plans everything as if it's all in our power and control as if we are the masters of our own destiny, that we will do what we want. We will go there. We will make money. We will, it will all happen just as I have scheduled out in my five-year plan, my 10-year plan. It's fine to dream dreams. It's fine to make plans. But James says, not with arrogance, as if it's all going to come to pass, just like you said. Now, if that's us this morning, James has two things to remind us of. Firstly, We're not in control of tomorrow. We're not in control of tomorrow. Look at verse 14. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. The reality is, for all the plans that we make, we're not in control of what's going to happen. Uh, Every year, my wife and I have uh, lunch, uh, usually Indian curry, actually, not uh, a roast meal like many Westerners have. Uh, And we take time as we eat our curry to reflect on uh, the year that's been and to look forward to the year ahead. And I can tell you, year after year as we do this, whatever we've talked about the year ahead, it has never, ever come to plan. I mean, we didn't sit down over Christmas lunch and think, oh, yeah, we're going to have a COVID pandemic this year. Uh, or we're going to quit from the Anglican Church and join Cross and Crown. Or, you know, we're going to move from KL to Pina. We never talked about any of those things over our Christmas lunch, you see. Of course, we made all kinds of plans, but they never seemed to eventuate as we planned it would be. Now, let me tell you about my friend Morgan. Uh, he was in his early 30s in a church of mine back in Australia. He was a devoted Sunday school teacher. Uh, he worked as a teacher in a high school. Uh, He was engaged to be married. In the prime of his life, all of his plans were coming together until the unthinkable happened to him. He had a stroke. He had brain damage, and he nearly died. Uh, He could no longer speak. He could no longer walk. Uh, He could no longer move his arms. He was in a wheelchair. The engagement was called off. He'd spend the rest of his life uh, in a wheelchair, as you see. Now, I wonder how you feel as you hear that story. I mean, if you're anything like me, you like to be in control. You like to have things uh, sorted. You, the, the idea that all of our well-thought-out plans for our life could suddenly unravel in a moment like that, that is kind of terrifying, isn't it? We need to be reminded, you see, we're not in control of tomorrow. James continues in verse 14. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The point is, life is transient. Life is uncertain. As Ecclesiastes teaches us, it's a vapor. Now you go up to Cameron Highlands, you, you breathe in the nice cool air, the steam comes out of your mouth, and then in a second is gone. That's our lives. Here today, gone tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
We don't know if there'll be a car crash. We don't know if there will be a stroke. We don't know if we will suddenly discover we have terminal cancer or any other thing that could happen to us. It's, it's not in our control. We can't guarantee we're going to have a job next year. We can't guarantee we'll have a safe pregnancy. We can't guarantee that the operation is going to go successfully. All these things, they're not in our hands. They're in God's hands. And, and even if, God willing, none of these things ever come upon us, I'm certainly not wishing that, life is still fleeting, isn't it? We really are here today and gone tomorrow. So to, to think that we can guarantee what we're going to be doing next year, we're going to do this, do that, trade, make, it's, it's crazy. It's supreme arrogance, in fact. Remember the story Jesus told about a person like that in Luke chapter 12. A rich man, he, he had uh, plentiful crops, and so he built his bigger and bigger barns to store up all of his grain and his good. He says this to himself, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. He thinks to himself, I've secured my future. All the money's in the bank, all the possessions is there. It just waits for me to have a wonderful retirement, a happy life. And what does God say to him? Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So the man, he suddenly dies, and all his plans come to nothing. But of course, we often do the same, don't we? We think, we act, we plan as if life is just going to go on forever, that we can control it, that we can bring it to the direction that we want. It's an expression of our sinfulness, living our life our way without God, as though we are God and we are sovereign instead of Him, instead of submitting to His plan. I think if we were to learn anything from the COVID pandemic over these last few years, this is the lesson. We are not in control of life. Everything can change in a moment. Life is short. We only live by the mercy of God. And at any moment, God could pick our number and it will all be gone. We need to humble ourselves and remember who is really in control of our lives. So that's the first point. We're not, to, we're not in control of tomorrow. And so secondly, we must acknowledge God's sovereign will. We must acknowledge God's sovereign will. He continues in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Now, James doesn't mean here we just need to go around chanting the words, inshallah, or something like that. It's not the words that you say here. It's the principle here, right? God's plans are more important than your plans. Uh, back in March when the, uh, 2020, when the COVID pandemic uh, was just starting, John uh, Piper wrote this very helpful book. Uh, it's called Coronavirus and Christ. It addresses some of the big questions uh, at the time. Things like, why does God allow suffering? Uh, what is God doing through a pandemic? Uh, has God lost control? Was the pandemic God's deliberate plan? These are the kinds of questions that he talks about in that Book. And this passage, James chapter 4, is one of the passages that he quotes and explores in that book. He looks at that phrase in verse 15. If the Lord wills, we will live. And this is the simple point he makes. Every day that we have is the gift of the Almighty God. If we take another breath, if we live another day, it is because of God's grace. Is because he willed it. And if he ever doesn't will that you live another day, well, your life will end. Now the psalm says the same thing. Psalm 39, Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. My lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they're in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. Here's the point. God is sovereign over whether we live or whether we die. And if that is true, then God is sovereign over everything that happens in our life. We must acknowledge God's rule. 
we must submit all our plans to him. He is sovereign over my work. He is sovereign over my family. He is sovereign over my health. He is sovereign over my studies. He is sovereign over my future. Everything is under his control. So we must submit all of our plans to him. To do anything otherwise is supreme arrogance. In fact, it is evil, he says in verse 16. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. If we are humble, we will acknowledge that our plans are contingent on God, that we are dependent creatures, not sovereign lords, that it is God's choice that matters, not ours. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, as he disturbed the proud plans of those who built the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, as he humbled King Nebuchadnezzar, as he boasted about his kingdom. God says he will bring down those who proudly plan their lives without reference to him. So the question is whether we will heed God's word or not. And you can see James closes with a principle there in verse 17. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. I think it's a helpful reminder. Often we think that sin is only when you do bad things. You know, when you steal or you say something hurtful or you fight with someone. If you do bad things, that's sin. We usually think that. But James reminds us here, we not only sin by doing the wrong thing, but you also sin by failing to do the right thing. That is, sins of omission are just as much sins as sins of commission. So if you fail to trust God, if you fail to love others, if you fail to be generous and help someone in need, it's just as much sin as if you lied or murdered or, or stole something. And that's true generally. But notice the word so at the beginning of verse 17. It seems like James has a specific application in mind here. That is, to fail to acknowledge God's sovereign rule over your life when you know that you should, well, that is sinful. That is evil. We must make our plans in the knowledge that God is sovereign. There's always a temptation to say, oh, I'm too busy with my studies. I've got no time to join church. There's too much work to join my DG. I'm too tired to read the Bible. But God can't be just squeezed in where there's time in our daily schedule. You see the point here? God must be acknowledged and served in everything that we do. He must be included in all of our plans. To do otherwise is sinful. God will judge arrogant bolsters. Well, as we come to chapter 5, James now addresses a second group who are liable to God's judgment uh, against rich oppressors, against rich oppressors. Look with me at verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now, James doesn't mince his words here, does he? It's, it's rather straightforward and strong. Most likely, James has in mind here those who are outside the church. If you look at the verses here, there's no exhortation for them to change. He just says God's judgment is coming on these people. I take it that these verses then are intended to comfort those who are suffering at the hands of such rich people and also to dissuade us from taking the same course as them. James has strong words for rich unbelievers, but they are words that we must listen to too, so that we don't come to the same fate. Well, what have these people done? There's three charges in verses 1 to 6. First charge is they have hoarded wealth, verse 2. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. 
So James says these people have gone about their life accumulating all kinds of possessions for themselves. They're constantly renovating their house. They're always upgrading to the newest iPhone. They're always buying some new shoes. They're filling their house with a million possessions that they neither need nor use and so on. Now, we might think that such a lifestyle sounds rather wonderful, really, doesn't it? But James says that is sheer stupidity. Because not only do material things not last, not only can't you take them with you past the grave, but James says all those things that you're accumulating, God's going to drag them out as evidence against you on the judgment day. The very possessions that you stored up and bought in your house are going to be used to stoke the fire that's going to consume you on the judgment day. James reminds us here, we're living in the, the last days. That is, Jesus could return at any moment. I know it's been 2,000 years now, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to come back to t tomorrow. He definitely could. And that day when Jesus comes back, it will be the judgment day, the day when the fires of hell are kindled. And this world and, and everyone who has rejected God's rule will perish in it. Jesus again, uh, uh, James again is paraphrasing Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus said. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, the point is, it's not that riches are bad things. Many times in the Bible, riches are signs of God's blessing. The problem is when we love and pursue riches instead of God himself. The problem is when our riches become our treasure instead of Jesus. Because our riches are not given to us by God so that we can hoard them for ourselves. They are given so that we can serve him and other people. And so if we are Christian and our hearts have been changed by the gospel of the generous God, if we know the Father of light who is the giver of every good gift, who holds back no good thing from his children, if we know that Father, then we will be generous too. The unbeliever won't be generous. They'll think only of themselves. But those changed by the gospel will be different. So here's a, a challenge, I guess, for us to consider. Are you a hoarder? Are there things that you keep for yourself that really you should be giving to the needy? Instead of leaving all the old clothes in the cupboard or the old iPhone in storage, maybe there are some, uh, some people who could, who could use that. Maybe some students will be very grateful. Maybe you could sell it and give things to the needy. We're told here, hoarding riches only stokes God's judgment. Well, James, James has a second charge here against the rich in verse 4. Not only did they hoard their riches instead of giving them away, but they actively oppressed the poor. Look at verse 4. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Uh, there's a big uh, case going on in the news at the moment about the uh, cryptocurrency trader who by fraud defrauded people of millions, billions of dollars. In James's day, the poorest people lived from day to day. They worked in the fields and they just got enough money from each day's work to feed their family. So if they were to have their wages held back, even for a single day, that meant that their family would not eat that night. See, just because the poor are seemingly insignificant in society, just because the poor probably don't have friends in high places, they can't afford the, the, you know, the most expensive legal attorney and so on, it doesn't mean that the poor can be taken advantage of. James tells us they can appeal to the highest court of all. They can appeal to the Lord of hosts, that is, the God who commands armies of angels who will come in judgment on the oppressor. These verses, they remind us of Cain and Abel, isn't it? Cain kills his brother. He pretends he knows nothing about it. 
God sees. God knew. And God came in judgment. I think this passage also reminds us of what was happening in Isaiah's day in that Old Testament reading. The rich using their muscle for their own comfort at the expense of the poor who were suffering. God pronounced his judgment. Their great big houses would be empty. The rich would be brought low. If you are a boss here this morning, make sure you pay your workers their due. And don't pay them late on purpose. God sees. Now, it's not just hoarding. It's not just oppression. James has a third charge against the rich, and that is self-indulgence. Look at verse 5. He says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have com- condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not re- uh, resist you. So James compares the rich to cows uh, eating their lush green grass every day. Why do, why do farmers let the, you know, let the cows go free and eat all the grass? They eat and they get fatter and fatter and fatter, oblivious to the fact that they're about to end up on a Big Mac. James' point, the rich, they seem to have it all. They have the luxury cars. They have the expensive meals. They have the club memberships. They go on the five-star holidays. They have the penthouse apartment. They do their designer shopping uh, on the ground floor of Gurney Plaza and all that. But God sees things very differently. God says they're just preparations for judgment day. Because God will not allow the poor to suffer at the hands of the rich. God will call such a self-indulgent, luxurious lifestyle to account. So we must beware that we don't live the same way. I remember one person, how he tried to avoid this. Yeah, his, his principle was every dollar that he spent on a luxury good, they would give the same amount to charity or to the church. So, you know, they bought an, a BMW that cost them, I don't know, what is it, 300,000 ringgit? Well, then the church will be getting a nice uh, donation that Sunday as well. It's very wise indeed, isn't it? It's a good way of protecting yourself against greed. So it's worth reflecting again. What does our lifestyle tell us about what we're living for? Does our lifestyle reveal a heart that loves God or a heart that has little regard for the poor? Do we have hearts that treasure the kingdom of heaven or hearts that treasure earthly riches? We could do an inventory of our life, perhaps. Where do we eat? How much do our holidays cost? How much do we spend on our children's education? How much connected devices do uh, do we have? How much is our house worth? And so on. Now, again, the point is not that riches are bad. But if that is us and we have all these things, are we using them for ourselves? Are we being generous and sacrificial? Or are we being self-indulgent? Now, apparently, Malaysia is among the top 10 most generous countries in the world. Did you know that? And apparently, young people in Malaysia are the most generous of all Malaysian people. Uh, and I've met plenty of generous people in this, uh, in this church, and this congregation uh, already. It's an encouraging testimony to the life-transforming power of the gospel. But even so, it's still worth asking the question, isn't it? What does our money tell us about our faith in Jesus? Because perhaps more than any other part of life, wealth can lead us away from Jesus. It's no coincidence that Judas betrayed Jesus for money. The life of riches and rejection of Jesus are never far apart. You cannot serve God and money. Well, verses 7 to 11, we come to James's third exhortation against impatient grumbling, against impatient 
grumbling. Now, we've seen earlier that most of James's readers, they're actually not among the rich. He's, he's writing to the 12 tribes among the dispersion. That probably means they're persecuted Christians who are running for their lives and left most of their possessions behind. They're probably the ones being oppressed by these rich landowners, which is why uh, James has exhorted them earlier in the letter to be joyful in the midst of their suffering. He's sought to comfort them in those previous verses that the rich who oppress them will be called to account. For such people who are willing to suffer on uh, on account of the name of Jesus, who have traded comfort for great trouble, the judgment day is not something to fear. It is a day of restoration. It is a day of justice. It is a day of joy. And so in verses 7 to 11, James urges us to patience. He writes in verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. James understands, I guess, that the temptation for the poor is to be just like the rich. To just focus on the things of the world right in front of us. So we want everything put right now. We want all of our difficulties to cease. We want our bank balance to increase so that we can have what they have now. But James's encouragement is not, you know, seek to become more rich or something like that. He says, be patient. Don't look for restoration now. Look for restoration at the end. Don't desire a fat heart headed for slaughter like them. Set your heart on the coming of Jesus. Because we're in the last days. Jesus will return. There will be justice. The rich oppressor will be judged. The righteous oppressed will be vindicated. And so like a farmer waiting for the rain, we patiently wait for Jesus to come back. The problem was, many of James's readers, we've seen, were not doing that. They were worldly. And and that was seen in the way that they were grumbling instead of patiently waiting. Verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. It's interesting, isn't it? James is a warning of judgment here. It's not just for the arrogant bolsters, and it's not just for the rich oppressors. Now he turns to the poor, the poor Christians, and he warns them that the judgment is coming too. Jesus is standing at the door. I mean, it's a terrifying thought, isn't it? You hear a knock from the, the door there later. Hopefully it's just someone who's coming late, right? <laughs> Jesus is standing there with his, you know, his fiery sword coming out of his mouth. He's ready. It's a terrifying image. Grumbling often seems justified, doesn't it? You know, how can those people do all these things? How can they do that and this is happening to me? It's easy to be self-justified in our grumbling, isn't it? But James shows what it really is. It's double-mindedness. It's actually just like hoarding or self-indulgence, because it shows a love for the world instead of God. The point is, you don't have to be rich to be materialistic. You can be just as consumed by dreaming of the material goods that you don't have as indulging in the ones that you do have. And James's point is, Jesus is coming back as the judge of grumblers. The biggest problem with grumbling is that you make yourself the judge instead of God. And we've seen that that is wrong back in chapter 4, verse 11. He said there, don't speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge. He who's able to save and destroy, who are you to judge your neighbor? But when you're grumbling about someone, that's exactly what you're doing, isn't it? You are standing in judgment on them. Someone might be living in a luxury house in Tumman Weston. They might be rich beyond measure. But for all you know, they might be an extremely generous person. They might give 80% of their income away to charity and the church. They might use their house to welcome the needy in hospitality. They might use their free time to feed the poor on the streets. You don't know, do you? You only see the outside. 
three-story house. Who are we to play the judge? Only God knows the motives of the heart. And so in the end, to grumble against the rich is just as bad as the rich to discriminate against the poor. And both groups are liable to the judgment of Jesus. So we need to stop people watching. We need to get off the bandwagon of materialism. And we need to let our attitude to riches be shaped by the word of God and not the world around us. James points us to the prophets as an example to follow. You see in verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job and have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Remember what happened to, to Job? He was, he was rich and Satan took everything away. His family, his riches, everything, even his health. But what was the end of the story for Job? He trusted God. And at the end, he was restored. The point is, the prophets show us the true nature of life in this world. Life as one of God's people is not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be smooth. It's not meant to be luxurious. The world we live in is one that is filled with suffering. And that's the pattern of the Christian life. Suffering now and glory later. So the point is, don't be too comfortable now. When life is difficult... When it's hard to make ends meet, when you don't have all the material comforts that you wish, don't despair, don't be anxious, be patient, be steadfast, endure. Because you have so much, something so much better lying ahead for yourself than a nice house down at Batu Fringa. Yes, Job lost everything. He was restored so much more. Yes, we might suffer in this world, but we look forward to eternity with God face to face. No more suffering, no more injustice. We're promised the crown of life. Remember James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. God is compassionate. God is loving. We see that in the end. Well, James chooses to end with one final warning of judgment in this passage. It's in verse 12, against dishonest oath-making, against dishonest oath-making. In many ways, it's the climax of the passage as James comes to the conclusion of this letter. He says in verse 12, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We know that James is very concerned about how we speak. He's talked about that a lot in this letter. It's no surprise he wants to end here. Undivided hearts will be seen in undivided speech, in speech that is transparently honest. Now, the kind of swearing James is talking about here, it's not uh, four-letter words or dirty language. He's talking about making oaths or promises. And again, he's echoing the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, I don't think James or Jesus is prohibiting us from taking an oath in court uh, or by visiting the commissioner of oaths to make a legal declaration. Don't worry about that. The point of both, uh, of both James and Jesus is this. Very often, the reason people make oaths or swear things is simply because they cannot be trusted. You, you shouldn't need to say, oh, I swear I'm telling the truth this time. Because if you always told the truth, then why would you need to swear in the first place? So that's, that's the point, isn't it? 
if you live a life of integrity where your speech is undivided and, and honest, then you won't need to make promises to people like that. Yes, you should make a promise to your wife or husband when you get married. It's good to make an oath like that. But you don't make an oath just to make up for your, for your dishonesty. And neither do we say things like, I'll pray for you when you have no intention of praying. I'll see you on Saturday when you have no intention of turning up. You're just trying to be polite. We are to be people of our word, transparently honest. Well, throughout this passage, James has been urging us to live in the light of God's sovereignty and judgment. So let me conclude with this question. Are you living in light of Jesus' return to judge? Are you living in light of Jesus' return to judge? I said at the start, money makes the world go round. But I hope you see that statement is a lie, isn't it? God is the one who makes the world go around. Riches will fail. God's purposes will prevail. And so whether we consider ourselves rich or we consider ourselves poor or somewhere in between, the point is we should have a very different perspective on wealth as a believer. The coming judgment reminds us that God is sovereign, not us. It reminds us that God's purposes will prevail, not ours. And so we should not look to riches for security and comfort and hope for the future. We should look to God. The Lord Jesus died for our sins. The Lord Jesus died that all of God's final judgment may be paid for. The Lord Jesus rose again so that we can look forward to a new creation. If we are believers, we don't need to fear the judgment like the arrogant bolsters or the rich oppressors or the rest. If we humbly receive God's implanted word and allow, us, allow it to change us from within, so that we are humble and honest and persevering and generous. And there is nothing to fear when Jesus comes back. It is a comfort. It is a hope. So as we finish, let's hear again these words from James. It says in chapter 1, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. So in the light of eternity, will you treasure treasures on earth or treasures in heaven? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your implanted word, which reminds us of the rule and the return of the Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, not to be ensnared by the idolatry of wealth. Help us to find our, our true security and hope in the Lord Jesus alone. Help us, Lord, to pursue true treasure, heavenly treasure, and not treasures on earth. And when, Lord, that life is hard, help us to persevere as we look forward to the crown to come. Lord, we long for that day when Jesus returns and we are with you forever in the glories, in the riches of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.